Hi guys, welcome back to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host, as always, Steve Hall, and today I had Jake Reed back on the show. This time around, we talk in depth about recovery, why that's super important, what things you can monitor that you might not be monitoring at the moment to help with your recovery, talking in depth about resting heart rate, also talking about sleep monitoring and things of the like. And I think you'll get a lot of take homes from this episode, guys. And as a reminder, we recently had the Team Full ROM guys over for a seminar. We still have that video footage available for sale. We also have a package available for sale as well in our store. You can get that in the description box below or visit revivestronger.com. But without further ado, let's get into the podcast. Hi guys, welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host, as always, Steve Hall. And today I have Jake Reed back on the podcast. You may not remember Jake, or you might be a new listener and you might not have been back there because I think we actually recorded an episode about three years ago. It was episode 164 on athlete monitoring techniques. And Jake knows a ton about that. And I thought it was about time we brought him back on to talk more about that, especially because things change, especially in athlete monitoring. I think like new gadgets and things come out all the time, which is exciting and also whether or not that's helpful. So for a quick background about Jake, uh, he has a PhD in sports performance. He's assistant professor at the University of North Iowa. He's a Renaissance periodization coach. So I think a lot of the listeners will at least know Renaissance periodization. Um, and he's actually in training. And I want to bring this up for a bodybuilding show, which makes it a little bit more relevant for a lot of the listeners, because I think the majority of us are bodybuilders or at least kind of into that lifestyle and doing that sort of thing. So anything else you want to let the, the listeners know about Jake? Oh, no, I'm super happy to be on here. I actually got a promotion this year. I'm an associate professor now. As of July, I finally I got that tenure check. And so uh, big relief there. But uh, yeah, I'm uh, it was in 2000, uh, February 2021. I started uh, working with you and uh, looking to do a show in sometime in 2027. So we've, we've got a lot of time to put on some muscle mass and it's um been a fantastic journey so far yeah i when i remember when you reached out to do it i mean first of all i had that kind of imposter syndrome because it's like oh this guy already knows like so much like you have a phd etc and uh, then also excitement of wow this person wants to invest that many years for a bodybuilding show and i mean a lot of the listeners know by now like natural bodybuilding you're not gaining kind of kilos of muscle every year so you need a long period of time to be able to make a significant change. And I know for you, you'd never had a significant time put towards like one specific outcome. So this was quite like a new kind of route for you to go down. Oh, absolutely. And it, it was a, it was a fun journey to get there. Uh, Cause I had a couple of years where I, I did focus on it um, back in 2012 to 14, 14 or so. Uh, but you know, life changes, things change. I've, I've done my fair share of things that are not at all related to bodybuilding, like running 50 K's and marathons. Uh, and it was, it was that doing that. And then having three kids that kind of brought me, uh, I guess two kids by the time I had started with you. And now I have three that really got me to see the actual value, uh, the bodybuilding, um, and the journey can have from not only just, a like the, the joy of doing it, but of having a goal in training, of having to do these things that are going to result in, you know, gaining as much muscle mass as I can as a natural. Uh, I'm not going to probably grow a whole lot. I'm 35 right now, <laughs> but it's okay because it's allowed me to really address my sleep and recovery you know we're going to be talking about today it's going to it has allowed me to really address nutrition uh, making sure that it's on point that it's being consistent and it's allowed me to train and to feel like i want to go train every day most days <laughs> uh, five days a week that's had really positive impacts on other parts of my life of with my kids with work with my family with everything and so it's been you know, it's, it's been, so far it's been an awesome journey and hopefully I get to continue beyond 2027, uh, just 
having having fun with it <laughs> yeah for sure that's that's great to hear and i think i can attest to feeling those same things kind of with bodybuilding it just because it is a lifestyle at the end of the day it has to be because it's it covers so many aspects like it isn't just that hour in the gym or two hours in the gym what have you it's your sleep it's your nutrition it's the stress management everything else goes into it but then it complements so many other things in your life as well when you can get that down pat so one thing obviously you mentioned was recovery and i think it, it does I, I think a lot of people take it for granted. I certainly think like people understand recovery is important, but I'm not sure everyone does because I think a lot of people look at that effort in the gym and things like this. They don't, again, respect things like sleep and everything else. So uh, let the listeners know kind of why recovery is such an important thing to know about. And then we can talk about some of the things that we can monitor potentially that can help us understand what that piece is doing. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I think it's really important to look at why do we even care about it? And because at the end of the day, as a natural in bodybuilding or anybody in sport, honestly, the idea and the goal is to be able to train at your maximum capacity to provide the best possible stimulus day in and day out that makes sense within your given plan and where you are in the competitive year or you know years and to get the best possible outcomes and we're in the gym for an hour two hours a day if you're a competitive athlete you might be in the gym for 45 minutes and then you might be at practice for three hours a day in that scenario there's still 20 hours of the day left there's so much more going on and you can't assume that the magnitude of impact of what you've done in the one hour, the two hours is going to supersede everything that's been done in that or, or supersede everything in the next 20. And so that's really what we have to look at in terms of recovery. And if we're talking about bodybuilding as well, you know, we always think about the, the anabolic processes associated with with bodybuilding right with growing muscle mass we want to be able to train hard enough to stimulate the proper pathways for growth we want to eat enough and frequently enough to stimulate the pop proper pathways for growth those are all anabolic but what we tend to forget or nobody talks about it seems some do don't get me wrong are the anti-catabolic processes the things that are making it so that you're not you know, shrinking things like sleep, you know, eating frequently is an anti catabolic as well as anabolic process. And I think it's really important for us to think of it in that way. I'm trying to stimulate consistent growth over time via anabolic and anti catabolic mechanisms. Anabolic stuff is primarily happening in that one to two hours. Anti catabolic. It's the other 22, 23 hours of the day that is going to be have a huge impact on how we grow and how much we can grow over time. Yeah, I think it's uh, one of the things I don't know why it immediately springs to mind, but it's just one of the things you could do that would be completely detrimental to like the bodybuilding processes, regularly kind of binge drinking, for example. Like you could fit that into like calories or macros, whatever you could make it like fit that scenario, but that is like catabolic in its own right is not going to be providing you good recovery either. And uh, I guess you would quickly see that if you were truly monitoring things uh, with with your athlete and with yourself. Oh, absolutely! It's in especially you know you think of drinking because that that's a big one, right? Like. I like to have a drink every once in a while and the deeper I'm getting into it and being only a year and a half into the true journey at this point, I do it less and less and less. Like I just finished week, uh, week four of, um, you know, five weeks of accumulation today, you know, before we were talking and, and especially over this last week, I kept, I keep thinking to myself, man, if I were to have a, a, a drink right now, even just to just chill out, hang while hanging out with family, I don't know if I would be sleep properly. And if I weren't sleeping properly, I don't know if I'd be able to train hard enough because I can feel my body right at the edge of, I can do a week, another week. But if I go beyond that, or if I'm not putting myself in the proper position, you know, likely an injury is not going to happen, but 
I'm not, I might not be ready to actually train hard enough in my peak week. And so it, it's those, it's that kind of thing that's like, oh, you, you really have to be aware of those things. And it does take time. Like, don't get me wrong. All of this stuff regarding recovery, like I said, I'm 18 months into it. I have the PhD. I have experience. I've been tr- coaching clients myself since 2016. I've been working with you know, collegiate athletes back in 2012. I worked with very high level people as a sports scientist. I've seen it all. And we have to make sure that we are like educating ourselves and continually evolving. And it really took accepting that I need to go into this plot process. And when I get into it, you know, financially is one thing for sure, but like, this is a process that I can actually truly make myself better version for everybody involved. And 18 months later, I'm better for sure. Am I perfect? No, but I don't ever expect I'm going to be, but it's been an 18 month process of realizing, okay, these components of sleep, these components of my nutrition, you know, drinking, training's never been a problem for me. I can go and train hard and exactly as I need to. That's never been the issue, but it's been the other pieces, stress management as well, mental health <laughs> on top of all of those things. It, it, it takes a ton of time. And, and a part of that is where I think that monitoring technologies can actually have a really positive impact um, in, in that journey. Yeah, I guess uh, some of them can just give you that immediate feedback of just i don't know like i I guess your heart rate might be more elevated the day after drinking or you might if your fitbit or what have you has like tells you sleep data it might kind of show that you didn't have the best night's sleep or something and then you can be like oh so why has that occurred and you can like relay it back to that you don't necessarily need the kind of but it's more of an objective data than waking up and feeling like a bit like underslept for example You, you might just shrug that off or not really i know when i didn't even think about sleep when I was early in my bodybuilding career and I just would be like, yeah, six, like, I don't know. I go to bed, I wake up, like whatever. I don't know. I didn't even think about it. I didn't think about the impact of my training sessions or anything like that. So I do think definitely things like that could be helpful. And actually it's one of the things I use to kind of diagnose how advanced someone is in terms of like, can they get away with like a poor night's sleep, still have a good training session or a few kind of drinks in the evening or, or like, I don't know, they actually get drunk, for example, because I think a couple of drinks most of us could probably have a decent session the next day hopefully maybe in some instances we can't but i think it is like you said when you've been doing this for a long time you're kind of on that cliff edge all the time where because you don't have that big window of opportunity of like yeah you have so much stress you can take on and you can recover from it fine when you're new to this but when you're more advanced you have such little you're playing with those smaller instances and i guess would you say jake that's where athlete monitoring becomes more important the more advanced that you get into these things as well Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and you know, you and I have had, you know, week our weekly <laughs> like conversations about this stuff and it was day one, you know, I'm a monitoring guy. I, I love doing it. I love the technology. I think there's issues, significant issues with the technology. Um, but I do think that are, there are really some benefits to it. And I've been tracking my own stuff in my own way. Um, since, we started honestly it's, it's been since day one that i've been using the technology that i have available to look at sleep heart rate heart rate variability my body weight you know what have you um and you're 100 percent correct it's that when you know you're starting off and you're looking at this tech kind of technology uh, you might see that you know you're let's say let's use heart rate it's a pretty good example because our heart is really um it's in tune <laughs> to be, um, you know, it's in tune with what our body is going through, right? And you might find that you have a drink and then it goes up, you know, six, eight beats a minute if you have a few in one night and then the next day it comes back. Okay, cool. And then maybe you're not quite an as advanced lifter and you see that and it's like, oh, well, yeah, it was because I had a couple of drinks. Well, if you go through time and you start to become more and more advanced and you maybe like in my scenario, you start to have fewer and fewer drinks. Now it takes a smaller variance 
in that heart rate to actually see potentially even more meaningful uh, change, things that are going to have that you can actually act on. So instead of needing a six to eight B variance or change, um, you know, from one day to the next is honestly meaningless. But and where I am right now, if I see my heart rate start to tick up two beats a minute, one day, another one beat a day after that, another beat on there, five days later, I'm up at resting heart rates, five beats more a minute, and I'm not doing anything different. My routine is set. Now I know that that is a meaningful shift in in my body. Something is going on. My heart is receiving, my is receiving a stimulus that's subtle, not the proper way to put it, but it's, it's appropriate enough that it's trying to work hard to fix something to deliver more blood flow <laughs> to somewhere in my body. And it only took me seeing a five beat change over the course of like, say five days. And I, I use that as a, a very, as an example, it's not standard, right? A five beat change over five days is not something for anybody else. It is very much an individual response that you would have to observe. But when you become more advanced and you are living on that edge and you have things dialed in more and more and more appropriately, because I think it'd be really hard to say um, that you're advanced and you're not dialed in. Like there's some people, don't get me wrong, they're advanced and let's just do whatever. I get it 100%. That's not the, that's not the, the majority of the population, right? And so you might be able to see those subtle changes over time and then you can actually act on it. But it's not a one day thing uh, that's going to allow you to do that. And so it, it, it can be a really powerful tool just this heart rate alone to help make decisions, help make decisions. And I think that's a really, really, really important key. And I feel myself going down a rabbit hole and I want to stop before <laughs> I get too far. No, it's good. <laughs> uh, actually, I guess uh, I, a good question would be in terms of monitoring heart rate, are there preferred ways to do it in your book and, and are there some gadgets maybe that people have like i have this fitbit here that tells me my resting heart rate i don't know how accurate that is how what what's your preferred way of getting that number yeah, anything that's going to allow you to do it consistently honestly that's the best way to do it resting heart rate's a fantastic variable to measure um i <laughs> being me i have an aura ring and a whoop band i'm I have opinions about both. One of uh, the uh, aura ring, I have very positive opinions on. Whoop, I have other opinions on. Um, as far as data accuracy and validity, reliability, validity with the two, it always depends uh, with any sort of optical monitoring device, which an optical monitoring device is something that is using lights to, to actually detect the blood flow. Um, so if it's got a green light, red light, there's different colored lights now even um, that are out, that's on the bottom of your device. It's an optical monitoring device. If you can see the light, more likely than not, you're inducing an artifact into that piece of data. And so that artifact might be false. And if the technology is developed properly, which honestly, most modern and, and popular technologies are, they're going to make up that data point. And if you're making up data over the course of say an entire day well how much of it is true so in other words if your your band is too loose if your watch is too loose and it's just shaking around on your wrist that data is junk now for resting heart rate which is nice it's typically measured at night while you're sleeping um and I don't think anybody is sleeping in a brightly lit room. Generally speaking, I assume that it's at least relatively dark. And so if it's loose and the room is dark, it's probably okay in terms of a measurement, which is why resting heart rate is 
generally speaking, found to be reliable and valid is because it's measured at night when it's dark and the issues that you might see with the looseness of it are, are just not there. And so resting heart rate is a really good one uh, as, as a monitoring tool. Uh, but again, you can't take it from a day to day or like one day to another. It's just impossible. Like everybody, everybody has bad days. We're humans. We have innate variation. We, um, I published a paper with uh, Dr. Bill Sands as the lead author. Um, there are a number of other of us on the paper as well, talking about statistical process control and measuring the individual. You know, in research, my preferred line is the case study approach. I haven't published anything on it yet because you can't get tenure when you're publishing case studies. Honestly. Um, uh, especially case studies being long-term in general. But now that I have it, it's hopefully a realm that I can go down. But point being, people are variable. We're all individuals. You know, we, if you look at a team, the team might respond similarly, whereas like two, the two, let's say two players on a team, they're, they're, let's say their resting heart rates are probably going to change in a similar pattern. But the two individuals might have two totally different values. They're individual, individual yet idiosyncratic. And so you have to look at the person over the long period of time. And so when we're using things like statistical process control, which we had created, developed the paper prior to machine learning really becoming more and more prevalent. And I do think machine learning is the way that this is going to go. Um, it's essentially just looking at a period of normal and saying, that's normal. I'm going to create a really simple average one and a half to two standard deviations from that average week. And I'm going to call that lot. I'm going to take that average. I'm going to add that one and a half standard deviation value. There's an upper limit. I'm going to subtract that one and a half standard deviation value. There's a lower limit. And now I might have a range of normal for me as 48 to 55 beats per minute for my resting heart rate. Cool. Now I know that because I'm human and I am innately variable, that anything within that 48 to 55 is just normal. But if I start to see, okay, now it's at 56. Next day, it's at 57, 58. Now we're getting outside those normal limits. And I'm also having multiple days that are leading to or demonstrating some form of a trend. Now that is something that is telling me, it's one tool that's telling me, okay, I might want to actually sit back and reflect on what's going on, why it's going on. And in the context of my overall training program, do I care? That point right there is where all of the technology fails, just blatantly fails. Like I said, right now, I'm in, I'm getting ready to go into peak week. If my resting heart rate's right on the edge of my normal, so what? It's supposed to be. It's going to be peak week. I shouldn't be feeling great. I should be on the edge of not recovering right now. So that's one tool that might be saying, oh, okay, yeah, not great. But what about my other tools? Well, I can look at sleep. Am I going to bed at the same time? Am I waking up at the same time? We have some potential like perceptual factors when I wake up. Am I feeling as good? Yeah, yeah. Am I, when I'm going to bed, am I going about it the same approach that I normally do? Am I maintaining my sleep hygiene? Or am I choosing to uh, go uh, like participate in behaviors that are necess not necessarily the greatest, like um, sleep procrastination, laying in bed, looking at your phone, watching TV, trying to get that nice feeling of relaxation, like your alone time, your me time. We've had conversations about that. Uh, anybody that's a parent can understand it as well. You're there. Maybe you start to do that more frequently. Okay, yes, I'm doing that but I'm still within the realm of my normal sleep. I'm still heart rate. Yeah, it's trending up, but it's supposed to be, Hey, guess what? All is good. I can have that conversation with myself. Say it's normal. Let's roll. Fantastic. <coughs> Excuse me. But I might have a piece of technology that doesn't know that context. And it might show me that my uh, I'm, I'm in the red, that thing, life is terrible. It's awful. You're not recovered. You know what happens when people see a bunch of red things that's supposed to be recovery? They freak out. 
for the most part, people don't respond well to that kind of thing. And it leads them to uh, create like knee jerk reactions into changing their program, uh, like negative perceptions of themselves. Like you want to talk about an an anti catabolic uh, component. Uh, It's not it's it's not anabolic to be down on yourself. It's not. And it's unfortunate that we have technology that can do that in the court over the course of a split second. Um, And that's probably my biggest gripe with a lot of the technology is that it, it, there's so much context that's missed. And I do think it's getting better. Uh, I think people are trying, um, but it's already out there and it's doing what it's doing. Uh, and so it's, a uh, there's a, there's a potential problem, um, with it in that respect. Yeah. Hey, Pascal here. I just quickly wanted to remind you of our online coaching service. At Revive Stronger, we put a huge emphasis on the personal aspect of our coaching. And if you want to take your physique and knowledge to the next level, hit the link in the description below. I know it's um, it's funny hearing you talk about it from this perspective. And also, Greg Potter is someone who I've had on multiple times for sleep. And obviously, these tools also track various aspects of sleep. Like Aura is like one of the, the main ones out there for sleep. And he's the same with you. He's like, He's frustrated because even if they're getting better and more reliable and accurate and things like this, there's no education yet behind it in terms of like, it says you had a poor night's sleep, but it hasn't diagnosed anything in terms of now, what do you do? Like, how do I get this better? They're just like, oh, it's bad. Oh, I feel terrible. (laughs) Yep. No, that's always, always, always been my biggest gripe as well. Um, And uh, I, you know, full disclosure, I have uh, invested um, in a company, um, aim seven, it's an app that is hopefully going to be released, um, soon. Um, it's the Dr. Eric Corum is the founder and it's, that's their goal is to take this monitoring tech from the multiple sources and actually turn it into an educational, um, piece. And that that's, that's what makes me excited for the future and why I chose to invest into it. And I'm not, you know, here advertising about it. I even even mentioned it to anybody, you, <laughs> I was not even mention it. Uh, but I think we are getting better. And that's why I say it is that there is, uh, there, there are things coming, um, people that are trying to do this, but we're not there yet. And, and that's the issue, you know, talk about sleep, obviously, Greg would be much better to talk about it than I, but you know, going to bed at the same time every night, waking up at the same time of day, you know, sleep falls into that monitoring recovery or into the monitoring realm of monitoring recovery. And let's be honest, it's only good for when you fell asleep and when you woke up, that's it. And when even the, when you fell asleep piece, that can get that, that, that's the really, really tough because I might be in bed watching TV for 45 minutes to an hour on my phone. And it might, and even though I'm chilled out and not moving, it might say, Oh yeah, you went to sleep. You had your hour. I'm like, no, I didn't. I was awake and I know I was awake. And then you can have the discussion of <laughs> monitoring sleep stages and all of this kind of stuff that is yeah. just trash. It's not good. Not at all. Apparently Apple seven can do this and do it like, it's been validated. I haven't seen it. I don't trust it yet. But if we think of it and be like, okay, well, what am I supposed to do then from the sleep perspective? I have this tech. It's doing that for me. It can provide potential value. Where it can provide the potential value is the time you went to sleep to the time you woke up. Because you can see those hours. You can see how they fluctuate. One thing that I've looked at, sleep efficiency from the time that I went to sleep to the time that I woke up and it'll tell me like total hours of sleep. I've actually really liked that. Uh, And that I know for me that if my sleep efficiency is around 80%, I generally feel pretty good. If it gets below that and it's consistently below that, I'm not feeling as well. I also might have a child that's teething. Had that happening recently. I might have a child that's sick. It's for sleep. Anybody that's a parent, you know what I'm talking about. Like you're, I, I, my oldest is five. I haven't had a consistent week of sleep in five years where I haven't been woken up. I was really fortunate last night. Nobody woke up, 
which it was fortunate nobody woke up, but unfortunate in that my middle child wet the bed. So get up and now you're <laughs> getting laundry ready. <laughs> but it's when you have those kinds of things, maybe then I can make a decision like, okay, if my kids are going down for a nap, I know that they've been waking me up in the middle of the night, they're going to need a nap. Instead of for me, what I like to do part of my own like self care is just laying down with them, reading them a book when they're going to sleep for their nap. And then I'll just be on my phone, hanging out, chilling, enjoying myself. But in that scenario, if I know, okay, you know what, my, I know from what I've seen on the tech that I've been less than, than I've hit my threshold that I know about myself. Maybe I should actually go to sleep with them. Take the nap, get a little bit more of that time. Also have the conversation. Is the nap going to influence when I go to bed later in the day? That's a big thing. But if it's not, or if I don't think it's going to, it's probably a good idea to make to, to take to take the nap. And so that that can be something that is quite useful, or it might be um, one thing um, that uh, was from the aura ring that I received uh, a couple of days ago. It was really cool. They did some sort of monthly assessment thing. I don't know what it was, but it said on the weekends, your deviation from the week was two minutes because I nice. made an, yeah, I was stoked about that because I've made an intentional decision that on the weekends, I'm getting up at the same time that I would during the week. And that was over the course, I think of the last month or so. Um, and I get up at 445. I walk on the treadmill for 25 minutes and I do it every day. Not because I necessarily like I like the cardio. Don't get me wrong. Walking, I, feel, I think is great. And it's good just for my own mental health, but, um, and it's also a nice me time alone time, but it's also just a nice way for me to start the day of just being active and up and, and ready and raring to go before everybody gets up at six thirty, seven o'clock. Uh, but it's at night when I go to bed that it can get a little bit tough sometimes. And so maybe I see that that time I went to bed is creeping up, which would result in less total hours of sleep. So I know my, cons my constant is when I wake up in the morning, but when I go to bed at night is not the constant. Okay, what can I do to, to address that? Well, one of the things I've done uh, lately is turn on the, um, it's not do not disturb anymore on Apple products. It's the, um, like a sleep, I don't know, I have sleep yeah, routine it's, it's, type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, something like that. But essentially the whole phone is just like, nope, all your apps are shut off except for a couple things like audible. So I can listen to an audio book if I'm laying in bed, 8 45 at night, boom, that happens. And so I open up my phone and be like, okay, I need to really make sure that I'm not doing anything that's going to make me overly excited and, and, and ruin my sleep. And so that was one decision I've made over the last couple months actually is when I instituted it it took me a year or more to get to, to recognize, that, oh, okay, if I do this and I, I believe that it's going to help me, this will actually help like make sure that I'm going to bed at the same time more consistently. Th that was a decision that I made based on the technology that I had uh, and looking at my own personal trends and what was meaningful uh, what appeared to be meaningful you know hitting that 80 percent threshold um knowing you know having conversations with my coach with you <laughs> that okay i'm doing these things at night to that are resulting in you know less I, less than ideal sleep or i'm not getting as much sleep i'm doing these things because i feel but 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 right whatever it may be and then at that point, I can then decide to make the decision. But it's not as simple, oh, you slept seven hours. All right, there you go. Which is how all of this monitoring technology, at least it's app and wearable based, that's what it does. You slept seven hours, cool. Go to Reddit and figure out what you should be doing, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. 
<laughs> that the the app that you've invested in sounds amazing i think greg would even be interested in that because that sounds like something he, he's been eager to see happen i don't know if he's even working on something behind the scenes as well because i it wouldn't surprise me if he was doing that but uh because he similarly is like not convinced by the uh, validity of kind of the different phases and things and then even if you get that data like people barely know what the phases are let alone not what to do to try and improve anything but i think one thing you mentioned there at least that people probably can use immediately is the sleep efficiency i think that's a really cool tool because you probably have it the same way jake where you have clients who are like oh, i'm in bed for such and such hours but my like i'm not getting to sleep and then you can start but then you need a, an education of some sorts behind what things you can start implementing to improve kind of whether or not they're struggling to get to sleep or they're waking up multiple times through the night if you don't understand again ways to improve those elements then you're still lost which again no trackers are telling you like are you overhydrating pre-bed or are you having caffeine too late in the day or maybe try supplementing with melatonin and then what have you like there's it's just mm -hmm. not it's not there yet so if you, yeah i don't know if the app is going to go into all of those things but if it is that's very exciting yeah, it, it'll be really interesting to see. And it and it's in beta right now. Um, still, I think there's, I don't know how many users there are, but it's there's still a ways to go, I think. Um, but it's it makes me happy to know that we're actively trying to 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 take those kinds of steps toward education. Cause I'll talk about this stuff with clients. I'll talk about it in my in my classes that okay, you know, especially you're dealing with college students college students are, are living in, you know, either they're living, either living in a dorm or they're living in an apartment, right? There's a common living area and then there's their bedroom. Their bedroom is their safe space. That's their personal space. Well, that is the place where they're watching TV, potentially. That's the place where they're maybe reading books. That's the place very likely where they're studying. And I guarantee, I shouldn't say guarantee, but it's probably likely that there's do, doing all that studying and all of that on their bed yeah. they're associating the bed with things that aren't sleep and especially if you're studying on your bed i mean i get it don't get me wrong i'm not like i'm not pointing to solutions with this but it's it's studying can be stressful for people and if you go from the stressful environment of studying and then you all right books down put it on my nightstand and i'm gonna lay down and go to bed that's not happening <laughs> it's not there's obviously there's processing that has to go down you have to come down of the studying alone first but then you also have this like thing that's in the back of your head of the underlying like of everything that you've done in studying and all the stress has been in that one place and so there, there's so much that honestly a good coach is going to do that they can help with that you know an app's just not gonna cut it with no, absolutely. I, I'd hate to think about, <laughs> I don't think I was that bad when I was at university, but you see some students who are like in the library, like overnight, and they're just like drinking Red Bulls or whatever to keep them, themselves awake through the night and what have you. And I'm, now I look back, I didn't know at the time, of course, but now I look back, I'm like, man, if you could just get your sleep, then you're going to learn better. You're going to process it better. You're going to have better memory. <laughs> like, whereas like, it's almost backwards. Some of the things that people try and do where they're trying to cram at that end, last point, but you mature as an adult. Uh, something, oh, if I don't know if you have anything to say on that, Jake. No. So something I did want to touch on was uh, with the heart rate, because I think that is a really nice little practical piece that a lot of people might have that data available to them. It's not something, uh, as you know, Jake, I don't use it with the vast majority of my clients. It's not something I'm kind of tracking on a weekly basis. I know we have that data there, but I'd love to know if you have any examples where you've seen it and it's really helped kind of, and also we can talk about this because you said it's one tool. So maybe talk about like the triangulation of different tools. That'd be really cool. But I'd love to hear mm -hmm. some examples of how you've personally found heart rate to really kind of help guide decisions for you. Mm -hmm. There is, so this isn't one that I've personally experienced, but probably the most classic one for me, it's from Dr. Bill Sands and um, uh, it's in the um, scientific principles of uh, principles of practice of resistance training. I had to look at the textbook I'll put it over there as well. <laughs> I, yeah. Um, and in it, he shows a graph where it's, a, it's his case study. Of a, of a gymnast that is it shows decreasing heart rate with decreasing body weight over the course of um 19 days 
19 to 21 days or so. At that 19 to 21 day mark, you start to see heart rate increasing and then body weight decreasing. That continues for another 20 days. And this is happening in the 90s, mind you, early 90s. Uh, and then at day 40, some uh, athlete has a career ending injury. And I think a really good uh, takeaway with this. And so it was really interesting, you know, as a, as a faculty member, um, you are observed by your peers, especially if you're on the tenure track, your peers will come in at certain times of the year and just observe your teaching, offer you feedback. Uh, and one of my colleagues, Dr. Wendy Weiss is a uh, former gymnast and a judge. And I was talking about this exact graph and I had it on screen day she was in there. And I said, like, I don't know, as a gymnast, body weight decreasing this much, I don't know if it's bad or, or what. And she's just in the back going, no, that's awful. And no, they don't want that to happen. It's like, there you go. So now you have this decreasing body weight. Uh, now, granted, in the 90s, this was early 90s, that might not necessarily have been the perspective, right? We have to keep in mind, you know, how things evolve. Um, but what we know is that, okay, arresting heart rate going down is a good thing, but then an upward shift with continued downward process, progress of body weight is bad. That means your heart is trying to, is receiving enough stimuli from the body that it is trying to fix something. It's trying to deliver nutrients, remove wastes, so on and so forth, to make it so that something is getting repaired. And clearly it's not. Now you can have psychological stressors that are going into this as well, which competitive gymnastics, totally understandable, right? But then you have decreasing body weight going on top of that. It's like, okay, there's something that's trying to be fixed. Body weight's decreasing. It's not getting fixed. Boom, career ending injury. And so the granted, that's over the course of 40 days. There weren't knee-jerk reactions that were made there. And so if you're looking at any... Any, any monitoring professional that's worth their salt, they're, they're going to tell you that, look, we need to see things happen first. As, as sorry as that is to say, we need to see things happen. Now, there might be extreme deviations in, in the individual data that we're observing that warrant you know, uh, intervention, but you're not going to do it right away. You're going you're gonna to let things happen because humans are innately variable. And Heart rate is a really good one to tell you that. Another example that I had, and this was when I was monitoring uh, volleyball players, there was uh, an individual who had a case of increasing resting heart rate. There was increasing feelings of helplessness. There was decreasing cheerfulness. Uh, and it occurred over the course of a few days. Uh, and it was abnormal for her uh, to have that. And you could also see it in her demeanor a little bit as well. And so I went to the coach and I was like, hey, look, so something's happening here. This, this isn't normal. Coach is able to have a conversation with that athlete and, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, that the way it should be, right? Like be, being a person, a good, a good coach is going to like be there for their athletes. And this coach was. And it just so happened that a few weeks later, that individual had essentially a breakdown in the middle of practice. And instead of the coach being upset, like what's going on, that kind of thing, which that wasn't the coach's demeanor in general anyway, but you know, being stereotypical toward coaches, uh, we had the understanding then the data allowed us to facilitate a conversation. And that's where things like heart rate can be really useful in conjunction with perceptual pieces uh, and, and other factors that allow you to facilitate the conversation either with yourself or with your coach to then make a decision, change things if need be. So when that player broke down in practice, it wasn't a what's going on. It was a we're here for you. We've got your back right away. And so it was all full of positivity. And unfortunately, I would, I, I'm sorry to say, that's probably not the norm, I think, a lot. Because people invest money in monitoring technology, and they want results right away. And so they expect when they see deviations that, okay, we need to make a change right now. That's just 
it's just not how it works. It's not good practice. And the field of sports science and monitoring just in general and athletics is evolving and has evolved a lot since then. Uh, and it is very much the, the, a lot of professionals nowadays do approach it uh, in, in that manner. Hi guys, Steve here. Just wanted to take a moment of your time to remind you of our online coaching service. At Revive Stronger, we pride ourselves on providing personalized service that will take your physique and knowledge to the next level. If you're interested, check the description and sign up. Really interesting. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm just thinking to times as a bodybuilder, because I, I don't closely watch my resting heart rate, but I have noticed at various times when it's changed, and normally it is body weight associated. So when I go into a dieting phase, it does. And I think, I wonder if you'd agree with this actually, Jake, where if you have someone who's maybe more uh, spendthrift or thrifty in their metabolism, you might be able to see like more stark differences with when they go into a surplus versus a deficit and things. Whereas, so for me, I, I do tend to adapt quite quickly to like a calorie deficit. And I see that with my resting heart rate quite often. Um, I actually managed to keep my resting heart rate elevated with the weighted vest, it seemed, because I was like keeping that body weight up and it, I guess stressing my body to that certain kind of level. So that was really interesting. And then when I go into mass phases, it kind of quite rapidly goes up and then kind of hits a kind of plateau for a long, long time. And then it will spike up at various moments where I don't know, I have a weekend of stress, like a work gig or what have you, or it'll be like a peak week where it goes up. But that's normal. But I guess if you have, and I get another scenario, I could see it with an athlete where you've gone through that kind of, you've seen it come up with an overreaching phase, and then you deload them, but then it hasn't come back down as what you'd expect. And maybe that's where you might, I don't know, active recovery phase or something like this might be instigated. It's another data point to help suggest that might be the way to go. Potentially, for sure. Absolutely. I mean, I can even think of my own training you know, back in uh, January when we transitioned into a cut. Uh, it was I went from a mat from massing to cutting. And obviously, I'm sitting there with uh, feeling uh, high on life coming off the mass. And so I go it into week one of my cut. And w w what did I do? I went too hard uh, in week one. And it it got to the point where it was, I got into week two, even that first day of the leg day was like, Oh, this is not good. Cause now I was starting to feel the, the, at least the reduction in calories, you know? Uh, and so that first leg day was like, Oh, okay. I, 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 I overshot week one. Cool. Let's see how the second leg day goes. And they were going, at that time, it was a Monday to a Thursday. Uh, and so second leg day hits on that Thursday. And it's like, this is, worse. <laughs> and so uh, I let you know, and then we just called a pretty easy audible. And I was like, okay, well, next week, we will essentially reset the volume and, and on my legs. The upper body was fine. I had no problems there. And so I maintained the load. We cut the volume in half on the, on the uh, leg work for that Monday and Thursday. And it was fine. I got into that week four then. And I was ready to go and I could treat it actually kind of like it was a week two-ish. And I think we were able to extend that phase another week uh, because we saw, we had anecdotal data for sure of just based on how I was feeling. And it was logical based on the context, right, of the year. Uh, and then as well, you know, some of my heart rate variables, I, I believe were elevated on top of that. Um, and so it was, you know, add, using the multiple pieces of data that we had to be able to, to, to make that decision. Uh, it's another area where you can look at, do I extend my phase, right? Sure. Like you can, you could totally see, and we've done it before where, all right, you know what? I'm feeling really good. You know, I'm not feeling totally beat down uh, yet at week, you know, end of week four. Oh, let's go another week. Heart rate variables look good. Sleep is fine. It makes sense for my life right now because I have this week, two week period where, okay, now I'm, I, I, there's nothing going on crazy with life. And actually, if we do this, it's going to move the next, this, this phase that's two phases down the line. It'll put it into a better spot for like a vacation that's going on or a holiday or what have you. So it actually made sense in the long, like the, the overall plan. And all of that context was really important to factor into the decision to go an extra week in that peak. And it's helped a lot multiple times 
in looking at those things. So it's not just the monitoring or recovery stuff. It's the, it's the perceptual piece. It's the having the conversations with the coach. It's looking at the long-term plan. Not once have we mentioned a piece of technology that is like designed to assess your ability, right? To produce force, to, to actually like, can, can I even do the load? Because we've talked a lot about anti-catabolic stuff, right? But then let's talk about the, the catabolic piece, if I may. Anyway, I don't mean to. <laughs> oh, no, no, yeah, for sure. I mean, the only thing I was going to say there is um, the thing, at least it's for, as someone I'm, I'm not using it as readily, it's an, a more objective piece of data that for a lot of bodybuilders who are a bit like gun ho and like, no, I don't need the rest or whatever, where it's like, that's an extra like point where you can be as a coach or as if you're reading it yourself, be like, ah, oh, but look at this extra piece. Like, this doesn't lie. Like, use this and that can help. For me, at least, where I'm like, you know, you need this active recovery phase. Like, look at this. That would also help me convince that person, or I don't know, take a diet break or something. Because, like, look at what's happening here. It's an extra piece to like, like you said before, like that triangulation of like, what are all the tools saying? If it's another indicator, like on your side, it can help make informed decisions. So that was really cool. But definitely talk about uh, the kind of the other uh, tools of measurement that some people try to use. Right. And so th this one I think is really interesting. And I think I might have said, we've talked a lot about anti-catabolic. Now let's move on to the catabolic. That's the one. Um, right. And so the things that are going to potentially help you with uh, decision-making in, in terms of training. Um, now there has been some recent discussion about potentially using you know, a, a body weight scale to, to squeeze the scale to measure your neural drive. Yes, squeezing grip monitoring is a something that is used uh, in, to, to measure neural drive. This is a, um, and I think it's really important here when we're talking about technology that's, that's intended to monitor your ability to produce force, or either like absolute force, the rate of force development, anything along those lines, is that you're looking a lot here at mechanisms versus outcomes. So mechanistically, you know, if we're looking at uh, nutrition, uh, you look at intermittent fasting data. It looks amazing in rats and petri dishes. It's it's fantastic. So do it, and not so fast. Put it in humans. What happens? Nothing. We have meta analyses now. No different than being in a caloric deficit. It's the same when we're looking at monitoring technology uh, that is designed to assess force. Mechanistically, it does make sense. Yes, if I squeeze something and I'm producing less force, or if I jump and I produce less, less force and I don't jump as high, okay, I, something is happening there, right? Is it bad? Is it good? I don't know. More importantly, what is the impact of that on the outcome of my training? And that is where I think we are really missing the boat when it comes to, you know, squeezing a scale, when it comes to measuring jump. I've measured vertical jump thousands of times. Not once. I don't think once have I ever found it to be meaningful in terms of measuring jump height. We did it with volleyball over the course of a season. What we found meaningful, we are using force plates, mind you. So we had, you know, highly valid, highly reliable, expensive technology to do this. We saw maintenance and rate of force development over, over the course of the season, maintenance and peak force over the course of the season, what have you. Cool. Awesome. FYI, volleyball players, they just need to jump optimally. Yes, they should have a really high vertical. Don't get me wrong. But a part of that is also just how tall are you? But Optimal jumping is what's best for them over the course of a, of a match. If you're looking at your ability to produce force, uh, though, it's not necessarily the outcome. Like, how high did you jump? Because I can easily tell somebody, okay, jump and touch the ceiling. And if they can, you know, touch the ceiling, they're going to touch the ceiling, right? If I try to change how they jump, they can probably still touch the ceiling. And so what I mean by that is that it's not how high you get, it's how you get there. And that applies to squeezing things as well, to grip monitoring. 
If you are not putting yourself in the same position every time, if you're not squeezing the same way, if you're not measuring how long it takes you to produce that force, how do you know that you're actually ready? Because time is a component there too. It's not an absolute. It can take me forever. Like you watch somebody pull a deadlift. They got as much time in the world as they want to pull that thing, right? Watch somebody do a clean and jerk, weightlifter. They don't have a lot of time in the world to do it. Well, that's, you know, for the clean anyway. Now, granted, the, the technical differences aside, I don't want to call it a deadlift, but like if, 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 you, if you think of it in that perspective, because they're not technically, right? Very different profiles there very different velocity profiles to create the same amount of force. And so if you're not looking at over time, how you create that force, you're not getting an accurate picture of where you are from a recovery standpoint. Additionally, if you squeeze something, well, how does that impact leg drive? You know, if you're bodybuilding, right, you're going... It, you know, all year, you're very likely less than four from fail all the time. So it doesn't matter how you get there. <laughs> you just got to get there. So maybe, okay, absolute force could be argued that that's a positive for sure. But again, how are you going to use that to actually change your training? And if let's say if you squeeze at 10 pounds or, you know, 150 pounds or what have you with one hand or with two hands and you grab the scale differently and you really crunch into it to really squeeze that thing one week and the next week you don't, what's that variance? What's that margin of error? And on top of that, tests like this, you know, you run a, a 40, you do anything, even if you go and you're trying to do, you know, a one RM test, what have you in, in a weight room day to day, there's going to be variance there. Like you have to factor in that there is, you know, this, this inherent error in a test in and of itself, it might be a 2% change, different error, which is really good, by the way, <laughs> that'd be amazing to have just a 2% difference in the test. And so if the test has an error, just like body composition, body composition is the perfect analogy for this. You want to go and do BIA, you got to do it the same way every single day uh, that you're doing it. You have to have the same hydration status, training status, timing has to be the same. All of that stuff has to be the same. And even when you do that, you might have a three to 7% variance there. You come in and you weigh and you, it says you're 12%. You could be five, you could be 19 that, that's a big difference <laughs> right there. So does that, does that change how you plan your nutrition or where you are in your phase? No. And so if you're going to do some form of performance test like this, where you're squeezing something, where you're doing a vertical jump, what have you, think of the context here. Is the test accurate? Is it valid? Has it been demonstrated that it's actually a good test that you can use that information to to have like meaningfully make change to the plan? Probably not. The only time that if vertical jumps, I really like using the reactive strength index. This there, there might be some uh, application here as well for for even bodybuilding, honestly, because if you just do after warm up, of course, a depth jump, eighteen inch depth jump. Um, where you step off a box, you hit the ground and you try to go as high as you physically can. You can actually get ground contact time and then you can get flight time. That's actually the, you know, how you create your height, how you create the ratio of flight time to ground contact time, which is the reactive strength index. And so you can actually then start to see, okay, somebody's jumping really high, but they're spending a ton of time on the ground. Well, guess what? Their RSI is really low. You can use that very likely as a pretty sensitive measure to neuromuscular fatigue. But again, can you change programming with it? Probably not. Should you is the better question. And no, I don't think you should. I think it's good to have. It's another tool in your toolbox to have a conversation with the coach to see these kinds of things. And then you can decide, okay, now it's a good time to make a change to the plan or now it's not. And I think at the end of the day, when we're talking about recovery, 
that's probably the biggest point to make is that are you sitting back and reflecting on your where you are in your plan, both acutely and chronically? If you do a change, does it make sense? And that change that you're suggesting to make, is it in line with the plan? And do you have evidence besides your own perception? Because, you know, we're humans. We'll, we're going to kind of do what we want, right? <laughs> uh, is that decision based on multiple modes of evidence that are providing multiple pieces of the pie? You know, it's we have to we want to have the whole pie. Heart rate's one piece. Potentially squeezing something could be another one. Sleep's a piece. All of these heart rate variability is a piece. Changes in body weight, that's a piece. Everything together is that does the change you you want to make does that make sense and is the change you're making an anabolic one or is it an anti-catabolic one and how might that impact things in the long term and if you think of it in that context it makes a lot of sense to not worry about that kind of stuff at all look at sleep that's a good one. <laughs> Resting heart rate. That's a good one. Having a coach, practicing proper self care, self care, reflecting, meditating, like those kinds of things, really thinking of the plan and doing the simple things. Well, that's where monitoring technology can be useful. Help it, use it to help you do the simple things well, and then it will have an impact. It's going to take time but it will have a positive impact. I think you uh, you closed off the podcast really well there. I'm like, oh, there's just like the final finishing piece. But all the, the time. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to just quote you on, I think you said kind of do the, use the technology and the monitoring to allow you to do the simple things well, which I think is such a, a powerful piece because I definitely see how someone, they could be like, I don't know, they could look at this force grip and kind of using this scale and using that as their like main monitoring piece. And it's like, wow, you're really mos like missing the forest for the trees. Uh, and that could lead them completely down the wrong path. So I know in the previous episode we recorded, we went over some of like the more basic things that I think a lot of people already are aware of. So I'm glad we got to expand on kind of a bit more onto the sleep element and also heart rate and how that can be helpful as well. And then obviously there are always new things trying to come in. I, I feel like it's like part of that like biohacking side of the, whatever the industry where it kind of gets a little bit fishy and a bit strange sometimes so i know i've i've even the one i, I remember i don't know if you've seen this one jake is like a, i had an app on my phone and i'd like tap test it was a tap test so as fast as i could in a minute tap uh, i used that like i don't know a decade ago or something just because i saw someone using it and I found it to be, even back then when I knew nothing, I found it to be almost useless after about a week. <laughs> I was just like, it's just not aiding the process here. <laughs> right. Yeah. But uh, yeah. I was just going to say, um, I don't know if you have any closing thoughts. Otherwise, I, I think you did a fantastic way to close it at the end there. I think this is a topic that you could delve into and talk about for an extended period of time. Uh, but if people want to, I guess, I think last time when I asked uh, if people wanted to get in touch with you or anything or learn more about your stuff, I think you kind of mentioned that you'd like people to get in touch one-on-one -on -one with you. I don't know if that's still the case or kind of where, yeah. where's the best place for people to get in touch. So it, it's, it's still probably one-on-one. -on -one. I am terrible with social media, uh, mainly just because I don't have the time. <laughs> I, I know what it takes to do social media well. Um, you know, I, I've seen it one, or just, you know, face to face with, with how Mike does it with RP. Um, and I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I'm capable of that in any respect. So, you know, it's, I, I would absolutely love to just have people just reach out to me uh, individual, like individually. Um, it, my, uh, you and I, North university of Northern Iowa email address. Um, and I think, you know, something that I've considered and part of, part of the reason why I have such a hard time with social media is that I don't know what to talk about. <laughs> uh, and so I think if I get enough, um, questions that are kind of similar, uh, I could, I'd absolutely be happy to record, um, just, you know, kind of like YouTube type video content. Um, 
Uh, but if it's, you know, pretty clearly a, a niche question that people have, I'm very happy to just answer things. I'm, I'm all about having, you know, real, per, real person conversations, not necessarily comment thread conversations uh, with people just because I think, you know, we get uh, a lot more out of it. For sure. Yeah, I was going to say, actually, if people have follow up questions, and maybe they can comment them below and we can gather those yes. together and we can always jump up if you're willing to do another call, because I think there probably is some really interesting questions and things that we could develop further that just because the scope of the podcast, there's only so much you can cover. So if we can have multiple absolutely. episodes to do Q&As, uh, that'd be really fun. So I would absolutely love that. I think that's a fantastic idea. Amazing. Yeah. So guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, and yeah, Jake, thank you so much for coming on. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. All right. Thank you, Steve. So I'm Steve Hall, founder of Revive Stronger and a coach of Revive Stronger. My name is Pascal Floor. I'm the co-owner of Revive Stronger and also a coach, of course. Revive Stronger has probably been going solidly for three years, probably roughly about three years. Revive Stronger to me, it is becoming kind of my child, my foster child. It's the gathering and getting together of like-minded people. We've been expanding the coaching team, which is helping us help more people, uh, but each coach can only help a certain number of people. Right now, it's all over the place. We have YouTube, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, but there isn't that community aspect behind that. And so the next step for us is developing a membership site. So basically we want to create a family and a community that is then benefiting from another. A really cool community for people within our little niche is gonna be a website. They will get early access to our podcast. You can access us, ask us questions, the community aspect. We have a forum there, you can ask questions, but also you can, you can lock your journey. It's also gonna be courses on there, courses, presentations on different topics. Discount of past seminar footage. We will log our journey as well. We'll start vlogging. We're gonna have documentaries, our entire athletic journey. Furthermore, they get access to an exercise video library. The exercises that we love for hypertrophy and maximizing hypertrophy, we're gonna go through those in depth, telling you how to execute them. We kept them concise and also mobile friendly so that you can watch them in between your sets. I'm super excited to grow this community. The amount of value that we're gonna be delivering is huge. And I'd love you to be part of it. You will get so much out of that. I'll see you inside.